We're grateful, Lord, that this isn't just our hearts, but it's your heart as well. You want to be all that we need for you to be, all that we want you to be. And um, that's a promise that is, is reiterated throughout the scripture, and we are so grateful for that. And now, Lord, as we turn our attention to Matthew's gospel once again, we pray as we always do, Lord, for eyes that see and ears that hear, to understand um, not just with knowledge, Lord, but an understanding that comes from the heart, that really sees you for who you are, because you are so different than uh, we oftentimes think. Um, and so just we pray, Lord, that you would just honor and be honored and glorified as we move into our study here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to continue on. Now, we, you know, we're familiar with this. One of the things that we're going to start to see develop, and I mentioned this last week, because we had this, this first opposition um, to Jesus. This was the first time there was that the uh, religious establishment, I guess you could say, was really coming after him. Um, but of course, initially, they didn't want to say anything. It was in their hearts. This was their, where he talked to the man that was a paralytic on the mat, and we, we talked all about this, so we don't need to go back over it. And he had very clearly said there, your sins are forgiven. And this caused them to internally, within their hearts and their minds, uh, basically accuse him of blasphemy. Now, we talked about last week that they were not wrong uh, because the Scripture very clearly teaches um, that the only person that can do this is God. Where they were wrong was, at, this, at least at this juncture, that they didn't recognize who he was. But based on that now, as we move forward through Matthew's gospel, we're going to see this opposition, and it's going to increase, and it's going to intensify, and it's going to come more rapidly. Because these guys are really going to start to question everything he is. And it all starts with that forgiveness of sin because they recognized that he was claiming to be God. And of course, if you don't understand who he is and you, you know, you're standing for what you believe uh, the, the, the teachings of God are, then you have to stand against this. So we got to understand this. But what we're going to see as we move forward is the more that Jesus teaches, the more things that he does, the more people that he touches, the more that these guys sort of revert, I guess, as it were, back to their traditions. Because that's the problem. Jesus was not condemning them uh, and never does condemn them for anything as when, they, when it lined up with what the Old Testament, what they would have called Tanakh, and when it lined up with that, he never had a problem with that. And much, actually most of what they did, did line up. The problem was when their own teaching started to enter the picture and take priority over the teachings of the Word of God. And we're going to look at a verse tonight. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it tonight, this morning. Uh, we're going to not spend a lot of time on it because we're going to get to it when it gets there. But I want to show you what's going on here and why this is becoming an increasing problem. Because one of the other reasons that the, the uh, opposition is increasing is because the people are beginning to recognize Jesus for who he is. Now, they don't have a full understanding any more than you and I do. They're just seeing things that they've never seen. They're watching things. They're hearing things that, that they know because they've been all been taught that the things that this guy is doing, according to our teachers, only Messiah can do this. And so the people are sort of find themselves in the middle because... When you look at it from a traditional religious perspective, if we start to drift to sort of navigate over towards this guy named Jesus, right? They would have known him as Yeshua. If we're going to navigate or move our direction over towards him, that means that these guys are going to perceive us, the religious, who we all grew up with. We all know the stories. We know all of the Sunday school teachings. We know all of the stuff. Sound familiar? But if we f start following him, then we're going to be leaving these people. And according to these people, he is isn't right anyways. And so the normal person, as we're going to see, even some of the religious, were sort of caught in the middle. They didn't really know how to respond to this. And that's why Jesus's words and his actions were so significant, because it was they, both words and his deeds, that, that verified who he was. 
And then, you know, we think in our minds, well, then it should have been easy. I mean, he's doing everything the scripture said. But again, you have to remember, these people for, you know, for thousands of years have waited for the Messiah. And it's kind of hard to believe that he's actually already here. But boy, he sure fits the bill, right? But, you know, but this goes against all of the stuff that I was taught as a child. It goes against everything my parents and my rabbi at my synagogue. It goes against all of this stuff. And it really doesn't go against it. What it's doing is explaining it. But they, you know, it's going to take some time for them to see that. So this is what we're going to see in increasing opposition. Now, it's going to be very important to understand a couple of things here. What's happening here is the, this, this opposition is going to come because of the two basic forms of what we call Judaism. That's the religion of the Jews. Okay? I hope you realize we follow Judaism. Why? Because we believe in Jesus. That's true Judaism, folks. That's what it is. The problem is rabbinic Judaism. That's where the problem comes in. Now, again, let me state this because I always want to make sure not everything that these guys taught and believed was wrong. So let's not get in our minds that the simple word rabbi means a heretic, okay, or somebody who's departed from That is not true. They, they were wonderful guys, they just were a little mixed up, and they were so steeped in their traditions that, that it started to get in the way. That's the problem. That's why it's called rabbinic Judaism. Because there was a system that started to develop because the temple had been destroyed. They no longer had a priest. Uh, they no longer had these things. And so there were people that sort of stepped up to the plate. That's a good thing. And they started, you know, trying to get back to the scripture and all of this stuff. And initially, it was the descendants of Zadok, the high priest, which become the Sadducees, which we call the Sadducees, which initially were the ones that had it correct. But they started to drift away from the scripture as well and started to embrace first the Greek methodology of understanding. In other words, philosophy takes place over the philosophical um, perspective, takes place over spiritual perspective. And by the time Jesus comes to the earth, the Sadducees are way off and not even recognizing most of what we call the Old Testament. So another group had to step up, and these groups called themselves, as we looked at last week, Padushim, which means the separated ones. We get the word Pharisee from Padushim. That's where our word comes from. So it means these guys had separated themselves. Now, they didn't do this to be obstinate. They did this to lead the people back to Torah. But the problem with that is, the same as in our day in the church, is those guys sort of began to develop their own philosophy, their own perspectives, and they started taking the things of God and they were so in making, wanting to make sure that everybody obi ob was obedient to the teachings of God that they put so many rules and regulations on them things, on these things out of fear of, of you know, defying them that it got to the point where it was, it was, it was really absurd. So all of this idea of the washing of the hands and all of this stuff, which is not Torah, it's not in the Torah, but this was what they wanted to do. They wanted to be careful. This, this whole concept of stopping, use, uh, ceasing to use the name of God, which is Yehovah, and instead of doing that, inserting Adonai. In my Hebrew class with my teacher as a Jew, he, they, just, they don't like it when if we say, and we use the name, they want us to say Adonai. And so, you know, you, 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 I don't want to say you play the game, but you, you, that's what you do. You, want, you don't want to dishonor anybody. But that's not his name. That's not. It never was. So, so you get this whole thing coming in. So all of these teachings, which were initiated to do the right thing, become, become the standard by which a person is measured. And so they come up with these, you know, this massive numbers of things that you can do and another massive numbers of things that you can't do. And it just started getting tedious. And they were obeying these things by themselves and all of this stuff. And pretty soon the people are just going, I, this, this is not the way I read in the old, you know, when they're reading Tanakh, when they're reading Old Testament. This is not the perspective we get of God. But this is what we're being told. So how do they know? So that's what was taking place here. So by the time Jesus comes onto the scene, the Sadducees still have the power because they're hooked up with Rome. But the, and the Pharisees, as well as the group called the scribes, sort of what we would call lawyers, 
Boo. No. Um, those guys, they, they, they were the ones that everybody was sort of looking to because it was recognized that the Sadducees had drifted over towards Rome and towards the Greeks and blah, blah, blah. And so this became a real problem. And so by the time Jesus gets onto the picture, what he's doing and what we've been seeing him do consistently from his Matthew's introduction of him that he is the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and blah, 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 that, that he is going to take us back to Torah to get a true understanding. And that's what the Beatitudes were about. That's what the whole thing you have heard it said. But I'm telling you, that's the difference because tradition had crept into this. And so everything that Jesus is doing is taking everyone, the people of his day, in particular, the, the Jews that he ministered to, but obviously the Gentiles. We already seen a Roman centurion that was affected by this. Um, but he was taking, he's taking the people back to Torah, away from rabbinic Judaism. So that that's the difference between rabbinic Judaism with its traditions and the messianic Judaism, which points back to Torah, back to the law. Okay, back to the instructions, to the teachings. That's what's taking place here. Now, sadly, in our day, you see, we like to say, well, those guys, how could they do that? But this is exactly what's happening today. There were churches out there today, trust me, we dealt with them in Belize over and over and over again, who want to revert back to the law. You have to observe the Sabbath. You have to do this. You have to do that and all this stuff. The, the, this was the Adventist, and it's huge in Belize. And it was a constant thing that we had to try to get these people to understand because they were wanting to go back to the strictness of, because we like the term, we're comfortable with the idea of law, right? Because it's you can and you can't, but that's not what Torah was ever meant. The word doesn't mean that. It means instruction. It means teaching, right? So you, you get into all of this stuff. So what Messianic Judaism, obviously initiated by Jesus himself, was to take people back to the fact that all of Torah, all of the instructions of God were pointing towards this one individual who in their own writing said would tell them what it all meant. That's the claim that Jesus made, and we're going to see it. We've already seen it a couple of times, but we're going to see it again. So that's where we are, okay? So having said that, as we move on now, the man with the mat has been healed, all right? And he's gone on, and we, we already talked about how these guys were initiating the conversation, thinking in them hearts. They weren't saying anything publicly. They were saying it within themselves. And, of course, Jesus not, doesn't only hear words, but he knows the motive of the heart, which is a scary thought. But he knows everything, right? So as that's all happening, and this, this particular encounter, remember they're up in the area now of the city of, of Capernaum, which is up on the northwestern side of the Sea of Galilee. Um, and that's where all of this is taking place, okay? This is where we believe that Peter lived, um, and Jesus. this is where Jesus stayed when he was in that area. So as they were going along with this, there's a road that came from the north down right through Capernaum, because Capernaum was up in the north, and it was a road for anybody coming into what we would call the, the nation of Israel. And on that road, as goods were exchanged between the countries, there were booths set out there, just like we have today. If you've done any international travel, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have to clear customs and immigration because you're coming into another country. If you go out of our country and re-enter into the U.S., you have to go through customs and immigration, right? It's the same thing. Nothing has changed. Huh, I wonder where we got this idea. Well, I don't know. We don't believe in the Bible, but there it is. So as you were coming in with goods or whatever, they had, Rome had guys put out there uh, that we called the tax man. Oh, the tax man. Uh, anyway, I'll, I won't say any more Beatles for you. That was horrible, but you get the idea. Um, so what was happening is as they would come in, then these guys' responsibility were to collect the taxes of, of goods coming in and going out of, of Jerusalem. Matthew, it turns out, the very guy writing this gospel, was one of those people. Now, a tax collector was probably the, probably not probably, but was the most hated of all people to the Jews. Because, especially if they were a Jew, because they were robbing their own people, they were in alignment with Rome, and Rome had said, we want 10% tariffs on, you know, bad word nowadays, but anyway, 10% tariffs on anything going or coming from the country. 
That's what we require as Caesar would put out and all this. So if the people, whoever it was, if they wanted to charge 15%, Rome didn't care as long as it got its 10%. So that's what these guys did. That's what they were doing. They were, they were charging a, an exorbitant tax fee and they were keeping the profits for themselves. That's what it was to be a tax collector. Well, one of those tax collectors, as we're going to see here in a minute, which you already know, is Matthew, the writer of the gospel. Now, this is really interesting because to this point, we have seen Jesus call Peter and John and James and Andrew. We know that there are four. And he, the people that he has called here are all fishermen. They're all rugged, hands-on type of guys. He hasn't called anybody that has what we would call today a white-collar job. Now, that doesn't mean people with white-collar jobs are bad. We're just saying that these guys were the ones that typically were the most teachable because they were the working men of the day and the women. It's not just the men. Um, and so, you know, they didn't probably, you know, go to church as faithfully as they should. You know what I'm saying? So they weren't influenced by the teaching. Isn't it interesting that these are the people that Jesus picks? And of all things, what he does is he picks a tax collector. Is this man out of his mind? Now, I can assure you of all people that Peter would not have been pleased at this. All right? But anyway, that's what's being described here. So I wanted to set the stage so you understand. Okay, now watch what happens here in verse 9. So as soon as that other encounter, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. Uh-oh. This is where you get out the crucifix and you hang the garlic and stuff, you know, and you do all of the stuff that wards off the, you know, the evil spirits kind of stuff. You know, little chicken bones and all that. So he sees Matthew sitting at the tax office and he said to him, follow me. Now this is interesting. There's nothing more to it than that. Jesus simply sees a man. What Jesus saw in Matthew, we cannot tell. It would have, I would think to me the same thing that he sees in you and I. He saw a heart willing to respond to his teaching. We can't see that, but we're not him. He could. We just don't know why. One thing we do know, it wasn't just to tick everyone off. Watch this, right? I mean, after all, is he losing his mind? He, does he worked with this Gentile centurion of all things, of the hated, dreaded Roman army, and then he gets his guys and he goes to an area which is absurd for any Jew to go to because we know what's over there, Right? What is this guy thinking? And now, after all of this kind of stuff, and now he's talking about forgiven sins, and you could just see the people just going, what the heck is going on here, right? And then he sees a tax collector, and he says, hey, come on, follow me. Is he lost his marbles? I mean, this is really significant, you guys. We have to get this, because it's so important not just to the quote-unquote story, but to the character of who Jesus is. He doesn't care who you are or what you're doing. In all of my years of ministry, I cannot tell you how many times I've dealt with people that said, I, list, I love everything you're saying and I believe what you're saying and I want to follow Jesus, but I have to go and I have to clean up my life. Right? Do you know how many times I've heard that? I've got to quit smoking. I've got to quit drinking, right? I've got to quit chewing. I've got to quit doing all of the stuff. And once I do that, then I can come. No! Jesus didn't say to Matthew, now listen, follow me. But what that means is, do we read this here? Matthew was a bad dude. No question about it. And Matthew had bad friends. We're going to see in a minute. Okay? The people he hung out with were people that most of us would not want to hang out with. They were bad people, did bad things. Okay? So follow me. And then he rose and followed him. Now, I love this about Matthew because he's clearly talking about himself and nobody wants to talk about themselves. It's not comfortable to do so. Whether we, you know, there's much made of that Matthew's great faith, and that's probably true. 
But whatever the case may be, he just doesn't want to elaborate on it. You know, and I saw in his eyes, I mean, you could see it, right? If you and I were writing the story, we'd say, and I saw it in his eyes, the eyes of love and the eyes of forgiveness. How could I not but follow this man? Matthew's like, he said, follow, he followed. I love that. Just the simplicity to the point. Because to Matthew, it's not about Matthew. It's not about Peter, James, John, and Andrew. It's not about the religious. It's not about a centurion. It's not about the dude on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. It's not about any of those things. It's about Jesus. That's the, his only interest in this. I love this. Now, it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house. Uh-oh. See, our first reaction is, what happens when we see a believer in places that we think a believer shouldn't be, right? What's our first thought? And frankly, probably right most of the times. What's that idiot doing there, right? But there are times when as a believer, the Lord just moves on your heart. You go, this is what you do because this is what he did. So what happened is Jesus sat at the table in the house. So clearly this is Matthew's house. Why? Well, look at the rest. That behold, <laughs> Matthew's one to make sure that we get this. Behold, make sure that you understand what this means. Okay? The Messiah. Matthew's clearly pointed, portrayed him as Messiah already. Matthew's getting it. And all of a sudden, here he is in this house, and he is he's saying that he's like, he's, you need to pay attention to this because this cuts against the grain. This guy is not like anyone we've ever seen and certainly not like anyone we've ever heard, right? Talk is cheap, you guys. It's not about, we always talk about, you know, we, we hear all the time, and you guys hear me say this all the time, stop telling me about your faith, man, okay? I, we don't need to hear anything about your faith. If your faith is what you claim it is, it will be evident in your life, right? It will be obvious just by the character of, of who you are. Check this out. When I was mining and working underground, and we'd, we'd, we'd bring guys on, and one time my shifter was there, and they brought this guy on. His name was Gary. Gary was a good guy. A little bit of a rough guy, but really good guy. Well, most miners are rough guys, and you wonder where I get it. But anyways, oh, and by the way, do you see my shirt? Those of you that can't see, this is barbed wire. Marie calls me Barbie when I wear this. <laughs> anyway, so we're down there, and this guy gets hired on. We hire him on. And so, so the shifter, uh, Bill, comes to me, and he says, hey, they called me Ricky. Oh, I hated that. Ricky. Ricky Raccoon. Yeah. Ricky Raccoon, right? Stepped in. Yeah, yeah, that's where it comes from. That's what they called me. So he said, Ricky, we got it. we're gonna bring Gary on and stuff like that. He says he knows how to mine. Okay. Says he knows how to run a jack leg, he knows how to do all this kind of stuff. So, so you know, I'm gonna put him with you for a shift. You need to let me know. And he and Bill literally says, if he can't run the leg, I need to know. Okay, because we're not gonna put him down in some drift somewhere if the guy's gonna kill himself running a jack leg, because you will die running a jack leg if you don't know what you're doing. So I'm like, okay, okay. I, I'm telling you. I'll say, Gary, you, 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 you know how to do this and all this stuff, right? Oh, yeah, I've worked there. So he had a really, he's one of the guys that had a rough voice like this. You know, a little bitty guy, a little, really good dude, but just, oh, yeah, you know, and stuff like that. I'm like, okay, well, here's, Bill wanted me to sit back and sort of watch you and blah, blah, blah. So I'm telling you, if you know how to run one of these things, you can tell in 10 seconds whether somebody knows how to run one or not. Just by the way they pick it up, Okay. It's, and I won't go into all the details, but, and I could just watch him pick it up, and I'm like, ay, ay, ay. I don't think he's done this before. Well, then you get the thing running, okay? And he's trying to get it into the face, and he's trying to collar the bit, and he's trying to do all of this stuff. And, you know, anyway, the leg's going up, it's going down, it's going up, it's going down, it's falling this way, it's falling this way. I'm just like, hey, I said, dude, I thought you said you could, you'd run. Oh, yeah, I, it's, been a, it's been a while. It ain't been a while. I don't think you've ever done this. <laughs> okay? You're going to die here today. And if this thing gets out of control and you bind this thing up in, in, back in the rock and you hit a slip or something in there, and this thing starts whipping around, we're both going to die. Point being, talk is cheap, all right? Who we are should be evident in what we do. It should be obvious, okay? 
It's, we could just go on. There's a thousand examples, right? But you get the idea. But Matthew's saying this is very important, and I want you to get this, that who Messiah is was not just words, okay? It's action. He is who he claimed to be. Want proof? There were many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Wouldn't you have loved to have seen the look on Peter, James, John, and Andrew's face as they walked into that house? Like I used to do with my kids when the boys were small, and I still do with my grandkids when they go into bathrooms, public restrooms. Don't touch anything. <laughs> right? That's what I do. Don't. These places are disgusting. I still do have my grandkids today. We did it yesterday at the ballpark. But anyway, you can just see these guys walking in sort of huddled together. Peter, don't touch that. <laughs> don't look that way. Just keep your eyes straight ahead. You can just see this. It's not described for it, but that's Matthew's point. Jesus is doing the unthinkable. He's not just going into a house. He's going into a house that's full of the dregs of society. I mean, think about this. It's unbelievable what is happening here. So Matthew is sitting there, and notice, it's not just a couple of tax collectors. This was the tax collector guild in the north, all right? I mean, there wasn't a couple of these guys. There were many that were there. Isn't it bad enough, Jesus, there's one Matthew, and now we're here we are with all of these guys. I remember that dude. He charged my mom 50% when she brought in her pearls. <laughs> Whatever, you get the idea, right? I remember him too. Everybody's pointing out. You can just see this. There were many tax collectors here. The most hated individuals of the day. Because they wouldn't have been in Matthew's house even as, well, they probably he probably wouldn't have cared, but these were probably all Jewish men as well. So all of these guys, they just, this reputation. But it wasn't just many tax collectors. No, there was also sinners. Now what that means in the scripture when we understand this is these are the people who live in direct opposition to Torah and to, to the instructions that God had given through Moses. They live contrary to that. They disregard them, they reject them, they disobey them, you know, fill in the blank. That's what the word sinners means. Because we know the word means to go short of, whoops, fall short of, or go wide of the mark. It's an archery term, like with an arrow, right? To, to hit your mark was, you know, the, the, that was the target. If you missed, you sinned. That's what the word comes from. And so these were people that had fallen short of or gone wide of Torah. They, were, they didn't listen to this. And here's this, this next statement is huge. And if you're Matthew, if you're a Jew, and hopefully by the time we're done with this, you will understand that to sit down with somebody to a Jew, especially at a table, and understand that the table here is not, you know, it's not like sitting over here, okay? They didn't have tables in those days. So Michelangelo's paintings and stuff, he was painting from a, whatever it was, a 16th century, whatever he lived in, I don't even know. Um, but he was painting from his perspective, which is why you see the Last Supper, Jesus sitting at a table with the guys, you know, and he's like standing there like this. They didn't eat on tables in those days. They don't eat on tables in, today. In Israel they do. But in most of the world, I've shared this with you guys before, go to Nepal. Go to any of these other countries. Some have tables, but most don't. The table was simply the setting where the food was placed. They put it on the floor. There's a mat. And then everybody lays or sits on this mat with your feet sticking out so your filthy feet weren't by the food. And that's how you, that's what's being described here. Okay? But notice Who's there? It's many tax collectors, many sinners. All of those who stand in opposition to all of God's instructions. And he's sitting with them. He's sitting in their midst. For these people, the understanding of sitting down to a table like this, that the Last Supper was on a table, or it was on a mat, you guys. It was not a table. Okay? And to do that meant an intimacy. 
between the person whose home it was, whose table it was, and you sitting there, you were partaking of this. There was a direct correlation, the direct idea of fellowship. Now think about what Jesus is doing here, okay? He is showing a direct connection and intimacy with those that were the most hated in the land of Israel. That's what this is all about. Now, did he know that? Of course he knew that. Did he care? No. Why? The very opposite of what they're going to accuse him of here in a few minutes. Because he knew these people needed him. He didn't care about popular opinion. He didn't care about the traditions of the day. He didn't care about those who were living in accordance with God's word, at least for the better part. He didn't care. These people at this table in this house needed him. And there he was. Couldn't he have stood at the door and spoken to them from the door? Yes. Couldn't he have stood outside and looked through a window? You know, they didn't have windows like we have today. Couldn't he have done that? Yes. But he doesn't. The very fact that Matthew is pointing this out tells us everything we need to know. And for us, we know that this is about Jesus. But what Matthew was telling those that would read his gospel was that this is the picture that Tanakh paints of Messiah. This is what the Old Testament says Messiah will do. We're going to see Jesus make a reference to that and tell these guys they need to go figure it out because clearly they don't get it. So look, at, and when the Pharisees saw it, they said, to his disciples. So somehow, I don't know if the disciples were closer to the door. We just don't know. But whatever the case may be, they said, why does notice your rabbi? That's what's being described here. Why does your rabbi eat with tax collectors and sinners? Gee, you think maybe tax collectors and sinners is the focus of the story here today? Because everybody has pointed it out. See, that's the point. And their question, and again, it's a logical question. They're not wrong. They're not. Because the common person, even in obedience to Torah, right, following God's instructions, would, would find themselves repulsed by those that don't. There was nothing wrong with that. But Messiah wasn't the typical person either obe obedient to the Torah. He is instructions of God. He is. So these guys say, why does your rabbi eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now notice what's happened. Another thing here. Before, they said in their hearts. All of a sudden, now it's verbal. Right? It's audible. You can hear it. Their thoughts are no longer held inside like they were about the forgiveness of sins. There's an increase in the opposition. They're, they're coming after him, and who he is, is, is expanding. And it's going to get worse. It's going to just continue to grow and to fester from this point on. Why does your rabbi eat with these people? Now, this implies a couple of things. Why? What, is the, what can possibly be the answer for this? And again, if you don't recognize him as Messiah... Nobody in their right mind would do this. Messiah would. It's clearly stated. Isaiah chapter 53, for one, right? So, so that's the first part of it. But the second thing is, why did your teacher eat with these people? So the, the idea that he, he's doing this, and this draws a designation of him, and it sets him outside of rabbinic Judaism because he's not following the traditions, Okay? And so now it's being verbalized. There's this growth that's taking place. When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician. Now that sounds like, well, that's a, kind of a dumb thing to say. I mean, doesn't everybody know that? Well, you do unless you understand what Jesus is telling them. He's telling them, you guys need a physician. These people need a physician. Because Messiah didn't just come, as we're going to see, uh, just for uh, for the unrighteous, he came for the righteous as well. Because he is the fulfillment of everything that the righteous believed. 
So who he is is for the righteous and the unrighteous, but he's making a distinction. When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician. You don't go to a doctor if you're not sick. Well, most people don't, right? Many people do. You know, I got a pimple, I got to go to the doctor. But you get the idea. So these people clearly were not in need of this, at least on the outside. But it's those who were sick. They're the ones that need the physician. And we know who Jesus is, right? The great physician. He's the one that heals. When I was with Terry and, and Gary up in a hospital this week, we pray that, you know, we talk about this all the time. When doctors don't heal, folks, they don't. Medication doesn't heal. It's all a reparation. It's, rep it's a repair job. It's not a healing. Fixing something. There's only one true healer, and his name is Yeshua. His name is Jesus. Because he can heal from the inside out, right? Now, I love this, what he says next. Because what he's done, and I don't want to say he set him up because I don't think that he operates that way. But this is a clear statement to them, to, to saying to them, you read and say that you're teachers of the law, you're teachers of Torah, but you don't understand what it says. Look at what he says. I have no, the, the, those, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. Not the previous statement, the next statement. Look at, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, right? I want you guys to go and to understand what this means. What does this mean? Because I did not come to call the righteous, but, to, but sinners to repentance. Now, the key here is repentance. He did come to call the righteous. He just didn't call them to repentance because they didn't need it. They weren't in need of repentance. But he did call, come to call the sinners to turn their directions around, right? But the interesting thing is, but go and learn what this means. He's quoting a passage that they would have been very, very familiar with. We're going to look at it in just a minute. It's from the book of Hosea, chapter 6. And it's really significant because what he's telling them is, I want you guys, based on what's happening here today, I want you guys to go back and I want you to read this passage and learn what it means. Figure it out. Because you don't understand it. If you did understand it, you would understand why I'm eating with sinners and tax collectors. So clearly you don't get it. So I want you to go back. Well, let's take a look at this passage. Sounds really strange to us, but we're going to explain it. Hosea is writing... The people, and you're going to see here, the Lord Yehovah is speaking here because the people had gotten to a point where they had begun to embrace other nations and the gods of other nations when they had a covenant with their own God. Because like you and me, they wanted to be like everyone else. And so this is what they have done. And so there's a recognition at this juncture that recognizes what's happening and says we need to change. Remember we just talked about repent? That's what repentance is. Notice what Hosea says here. Come and let us return to Yehovah, to the Lord. For he has torn us, but he will heal us. The things that we're suffering, he has allowed to happen to us because we have brought it upon ourselves. But he wants to heal. Do you see where we're already headed with this? Here's the mindset. God will do what is necessary to bring healing, right? And that's what's being taught here. For he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. See? Because the religious idea was anything that goes against God, that God is going to do this and, and it's over for you, you're done, you're outside the faith, you're no longer a part of the Jewish community, you're no longer a part of the covenant people of God, and so on. That's what's being described here. That's what got them to the point that they were at, where they started drawing lines. But he will heal us, and he has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. I'm not going to go into the whole day thing. Is this a day, or is this a month, or is it an eon? Who the crud cares? That's not the point. The point is 
that whenever this period of time, whatever it may be, when this period of time has reached its conclusion, he's going to revive. I think we know when that is, but you get the idea, right? He's going to revive us. Notice, though, on the third day, he will what? Raise us up. Huh. The resurrection isn't taught in the Old Testament. Funky, stinking, hunky. It's everywhere in the Old Testament. But our traditions, remember we said we're just as guilty? In the church today, we no longer need the Old Testament. See? It's no longer viable to us today. I mean, that's law. We're in the grace. Well, you're about to see that Jesus is going to hit you right square between the eyes. I'm probably not going to get it today because I'm rattling. But if you think that you understand, let me show you where we're going to show you that we have our own traditions that need to be corrected. That Jesus is talking about an old garment with a new patch and a new wine with an old bottle, and you think that's telling us to separate from the Old Testament? Guess again. That is not what it's saying. But that's what traditionally we have taught. It's traditionally what we have believed, but that's not what he said. He didn't say anything like that. That's a tradition in the church. Try to tell that to people, and they will resist that teaching. You know why? Because our traditions don't embrace it. It's uncomfortable. Right? When I say Yehovah instead of Lord, it makes us uneasy, doesn't it? Why? Because our tradition says we don't say Yehovah. We say Lord. Well, tell that to the Spanish. They don't seem to have a problem with it, right? But for we, we do. Well, it's just this, and this is how we do it. That's right. That's right. You're steeped in tradition just like everybody else. And that's okay as long as we understand that. But that's what it is. That's where the problem comes in. Again, meeting on Sunday. Where in the scripture does it say that we're required to meet on a Sunday? It doesn't. So why do we meet on a Sunday? Because traditionally, we believe that the early people met on a Sunday because of resurrection. But that's a tradition, isn't it? Yes, it is. Try to change it. Watch what happens. We don't have traditions. We're not like those Old Testament people, really. Yes, we are. Like I said, let's do our midweek study on Tuesday. Oh, but that's not midweek, Rick. That's three days post-Sunday. You want to call it that, that'll be okay. But don't call it a midweek Sunday because it's not midweek. Right? You see? So... Before we start pointing fingers, like I said last week, and I've said like a thousand times, and we'll say a thousand times this future, spend a little time in front of the mirror. But this idea that the Old Testament has been set aside for the new is absolute absurdity. It is nowhere in the Scripture. So after two days, he will revive us on the third day, resurrection. He will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Verse 3, let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of Yehovah. Oh, I wish he wouldn't say that. I wish he'd say, Lord, it says Lord, doesn't it? Might I remind you of tradition? His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain when we desperately need him. Like the latter and the former rain to the earth. Because in their days, their, their um, harvest thing was all based on the early spring rains and the latter uh, 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 fall rains, not fall, summer rains. So, so what they're saying is just when we need him to revive us, he will do so, whether it's early or whether it's late is irrelevant. He will do that. This is Old Testament. Isn't this everything that Jesus is teaching us in the new? Of course it is. Okay. So what the heck does this have to do with what he just said? Well, we'll see in a minute. Now God is going to speak. Oh, Ephraim. What shall I do to you? O Judah, what shall I do to you? For your faithfulness is like a morning cloud. Remember the rain? For your faithfulness, both the northern tribes of, of, um, uh, of, uh, of Ephraim and the southern tribes of Judah, both of you, your faithfulness is like a morning cloud and like the early dew, it goes away. Your faithfulness doesn't remain. It looks really good in the early morning until there's a little sunshine applied to it and it just sort of dissipates. Your faithfulness is just like that. Your relationship with me, that's what it's like. You look great in the morning with the dew and all of the stuff, but then it just fades away. Therefore, 
I have hewn them by the prophets. This is why I sent the prophets, the ones that proclaim the truth. This is why I sent them. To keep you from becoming clouds that dissipate. Funny how the New Testament talks about this and talks about uh, that life is like a vapor that appears for a short time and vanishes. You see, these are consistent teachings throughout the scripture. Although we don't need the New Te Old Testament anymore. That's Old Covenant. That's law. Really? Then why did they keep using it in the New? I don't understand. But anyways... Therefore, I've hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by, their, by the words of, of my mouth. And your judgments are like, the, are like light that goes forth. So what I'm saying is I'm cutting these guys to the bone. They need to understand the truth. Now, here it is. Based on all of this stuff. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Okay, let's stop right there. But that's our phrase. Whoops, it didn't click. There it is that Jesus told them to go and learn, right? What was the key there? What's he doing with the tax centers? You know what? Why is he with them? Well, it turns out that they and their ancestors were no different than the tax collectors and sinners. You see, were they not in the same boat? These people, God just said, listen, I had to, I've sent the prophets to you to hold you guys accountable. The judgment has come upon you guys, not because of anything I've done, but because of what you've done. Right? Your, your, your faithfulness is just words. Remember? Talk, talk, talk. No do, do, do. That's what's going on. Well, anyway, we'll just let that go. Those kids would have liked that one. But anyway, um, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice. What's he saying? I desire instruction, teaching. I desire reaching out to those in need more than I care about your religion. That's what he's saying. I am interested in mercy. The word mercy, kased, it literally means mercy or, or, or mercy that is extended on the basis of love, which is why you read it in your, in your um, English translations. Oftentimes, the word kased is translated as loving kindness. That's why it's translated that way. This is what God wants. The religious stuff has its place, but the priority is mercy. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I want kindness, which is motivated by love, expressed to people more than I care about your religious observance. It's not important. What's important is mercy. Well, where do we extend mercy from the realm that we live in? Towards other people. The same thing that God is doing for Israel, that, that he's going to you know, repair them in two days, and he's going to lift them up on the third day, even though their faithfulness was waning on a continual basis, even though their sacrifices had become their priority rather than their savior, right? That's all the stuff that's being done. So I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Both those things, sacrifice, burnt offerings, that's the religious system, as important as they were. The problem is the traditions had made those things the priority and not what those things meant because those things were pointing to the very one that pointed these guys back to these verses. Do you see? Go and learn what this means. You guys are more interested in the fact that I'm here with tax collectors and sinners while you ignore the very scripture that you claim gives you that authority, says that this is exactly where we should be. Because God says, I desire, desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But like men, they transgressed the covenant. There they dwelt, dealt treacherously with me. Who's dealing treacherously with him here? The ones that put sacrifice and burnt offerings, quote-unquote the religious, the traditional rabbis, when they put those things before God and his desire for mercy and simply knowing him, knowing him fully and completely. Now, this is an interesting point. Notice what verse 7 says, but like men. You know it doesn't say that? Do you know what it says here? 
Because does that make sense? But like men, they have transgressed the covenant. What men? Well, who's being described here? See, the word literally is, anybody want to take a guess? Adam, Adam. It literally says, but like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. Well, well, we know that Adam means mankind. Well, it does, except when the context would dictate otherwise, and this clearly would dictate otherwise. Why? Because what did Adam do? He violated the covenant, right? Don't eat of this tree. If you do, this is what's going to happen. What did Adam do? He ate of the tree. He disregarded the covenant. So this is talking about a specific event, not a generalized thing, which the word men, mankind, makes it. Now, this was a specific transgression, moving beyond or outside of something that was agreed upon, ignoring it, right, rebelling against it, rejecting it. But like men, like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt treacherously with me. Now, here's the interesting thing. Which there? There. I mean, what time frame is he talking about? Adam's rejection of the covenant or the people just described in Hosea chapter 6? Oh, I would say both because that's the point. Now, does it make more sense? I can't believe that your rabbi is sitting with these sinners and with these tax collectors. Doesn't he know better? And Jesus said, you know what? I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You need to go figure out what that means because you don't understand. And he points them right to this passage. Interesting. But that's Old Testament theology. That's law, Rick. Really? Jesus doesn't seem to think so. Seems like he goes beyond the law because he's not asking for sacrifice and offerings. He's asking for genuine, genuine intimacy with God in the vertical realm, which plays out in the horizontal realm with the people that need mercy, need loving kindness. In other words, God wants his people to be the instruments of his loving kindness. It's in the Old Testament, you guys. It's right here. And this isn't the only place, trust me. But there it is. That's what's being described here. Now, what's really interesting about this is that we're gonna, we'll, we'll go through one more verse here because it's going to tie. So, so we were, I think you're getting the idea of tradition. Uh, Messian, uh, rabbinic Judaism is tradition. Okay, Messianic Judaism, that's Torah. So when, we, when we're talking about this, so you understand where we're going. And this is what Jesus said. We have already seen this verse. Do not think, okay? So this idea that the Old Testament is done and the new has arrived is absolute absurdity. Why? Because Jesus said so. Jesus said so. I didn't. No one else did. Jesus did. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law. Oh, see there? He's abolishing the law. Oh, I think you already know where we're headed with this. Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Now let's read what he actually said, because that's horrible translation. Do not think that I have come to set aside, not the law, but Torah, the instructions. Don't think that I came to set the instructions of God aside, or the instructions of the prophets, for that matter. We just read why God used them and how he used them. Okay. I have not come to abolish. Oh, wait a minute. No, I didn't come to set them aside. Remember the word that's used here, that Matthew uses? It's the exact same word that God said to Moses when he was at the burning bush. Take your sandals off and set them aside because you're standing on holy ground. It's the same word. Exact same word. Don't set, I want you to set these things aside. Jesus said, I'm not doing that. I'm not pushing off God's instructions. Okay? Do not think that I've come to set aside the instructions of God or the prophets. I have not come to set them aside, but to fulfill them. See, to bring them to an end. Rick, that's what it says. That's not what it says. It's not what it says. That's how we read it because that's what our tradition tells us and it makes us feel comfortable because after all, Jesus fulfilled them. The law is done, right? Served its purpose. Has it? He doesn't seem to think so. And he's going to abide by the law later as we go on. So is Paul. So is Peter. So are they all. Right? But they're going to drift in and out of the whole tradition aspect of it too. No, no. I didn't come to set the Torah aside or the prophets. I have not come to set them aside, but to explain them. Oh, that changes everything, doesn't it? But our tradition says, because we've been talking about their traditions, what does our tradition say? It's law versus grace. Bull. It's never been, nor will it ever be, an issue of law and grace. 
Never. The Torah, the instructions of God, are grace. God's grace, his kindness and stuff like that, are his instructions. You cannot separate them. Our tradition says you can. So we're just as guilty. But didn't our God say, you know what, I desire mercy and not sacrifice? I'm more interested in your mercy towards one another. See, actions speak louder than words. I'm more interested in that than I am in your traditions. Yeah. See, that's what's happening here. When we really read it for what it says, all of a sudden, it makes sense. Right? It just does. It all comes together. The same God that spoke creation into existence and spoke through his prophets and everybody else in the Tanakh, in the, in the early teachings, the instructions, are thou fulfilled and exemplified for us in the new, in the restored, in the renewed covenant, right? Until Messiah comes back and straightens it all out. It's a perfect picture. There's not a stop. The Old Testament, New Testament. No no. This is, what, this is one thing, if you study the, the Messianic Jews, the Jews that have become believers in Jesus, this really drives them up a wall. The idea that we, Gentile believers, draw a distinction between old and new. It is not. It's why they call their New Testament Brit Chadashah. It means the renewed. The covenant has just been renewed. It's been renewed. It's been, it's been refreshed because the one that Torah was about has come. That's how they see it. And it makes all the sense in the world. So we're going to have to stop there. So what we're going to see now as we go forward in this is this increasing opposition. We're going to see this, and he's going to constantly go after them. He's not going after them because of Torah. He's going after them because of tradition. Because their tradition, like ours, has taken precedence over tradition. I mean, over Torah, right? And he's changing all that. He's showing them. We could go on and on and show that's exactly what Paul teaches us. It's exactly what James teaches us. It's exactly what Jude and John and Mark and Luke and, uh, uh, did I miss anybody? James. All the guys said the same stuff. We just don't see it because our tradition draws a distinction, but there is no distinction. Is God the same yesterday, today, and forever, or is he not? How can one then end to bring into another? Didn't God see the whole picture? Was he confused? See, that's what's happened. So now as the folks come up to pass out the elements, this is the significance of the communion table. That's why this is so important. Because they are, we know that this was on Passover Eve that this took place, on the eve of Passover, I should say. And we know that from a Jewish perspective, this was a really holy, religious period of time, right? I mean, they really observed this, although they were more about unleavened bread than they were about actually the Passover, which is interesting, but whatever. But it was a very significant time. And it's at that time in a religious aspect, when the religious themselves, Sadducees, Pharisees, um, uh, the scribes, anybody that was religious, they were doing all of the religious things. And during that period of time, Jesus is meeting at the table. We all know what a table is now, right? Was meeting at the table with his called ones, his disciples. But it was in a completely different setting, wasn't it? It wasn't a religious observation of lighting candles, of burning incense, of saying prayers, of doing all of the religious stuff that we find ourselves getting wrapped around the axle in. He spent that Passover with them with nothing to do with religion, but completely relationally. As they laid on the ground at that mat, and he said, or he established what we now call the communion table. At the very moment where the religious were observing their sacrifice, their offerings, and their religious obligations, Jesus is doing exactly what we just read in Hosea chapter 6. Mercy. These guys needed mercy that night. He just told them they were going to arrest him, take him, kill him. But it was going to be okay because he'd raised in three days, which for whatever reason they didn't hear that part. But anyway, 
So he chooses the most intimate relationship to, to, draw, to draw what the Passover was always meant to be. He made it intimate with these guys. How did he do it? He talked about it as a wedding. We just had a wedding in here yesterday. The intimacy that's shared there between all of the people that are engaged in it, you know, from the officiant, is that how you say it, the aficionado, but I had whatever I was, the guy up front, um, to the to the relationship that, that you know the of the bridal, <clears throat> excuse me, the bridal part of the families and the friends and the you know in the congregation, the going to have a fellowship meal after that. It's all about intimacy. So it shouldn't be surprising that on Pesach, while everybody else is looking at religion, Jesus is teaching relationship, and he ties it to a marriage. Now, here's an interesting thing, because we said before, not all their traditions, there was anything wrong with them. Did you know that Jesus used the rabbinic tradition that night at the supper table? Remember the third cup? To this day, they do that? That wasn't Torah. That was tradition. Jesus didn't have a problem with that. He said, I'm not going to drink from this cup again until we drink it together in heaven. See? That was tradition. Jesus didn't have a problem with their traditions. There's nothing overtly wrong with them unless they got in the way of Torah. That's where the problem is. So as they're sitting there that night, we know the story. As they're eating the supper table that Jesus reminds them of what's, go <clears throat> excuse me, what's going on here and the significance of this. And they know and clearly understand that this is, this setting is a, uh, is a, uh, is a marriage. There's, there's no mistaking this, okay? So again, do we have traditions? Yes, we do. We're partaking in one right now. Now, we should observe because we're told to do it. I'm talking about the way that we do it, right? It has been turned into religion. Certainly for organized religion, but we do the same thing as well. <clears throat> when we do it, how often we do it, how we do it. Can't tell you how many times I've been questioned over the years on the way we do communion. Well, if we're going to do it the biblical way, shouldn't we like drink out of one cup and all pass it around? It's like, yeah, there's this thing out there now that all these people that are drinking Corona beer have called coronavirus. <laughs> Not sure we should be passing that around. But that's, this is, these are literal things that have been said to me, and I've been challenged. Well, the Bible says this is how you do it. And I said, okay. So the Bible also says they drank wine. Should we be passing around wine? Well, I don't know about that. Well, well now wait a minute. So your tradition is okay. I mean, you can do this and get to this point, but the minute we get there, well, I don't think we you know Christians should drink alcohol, so we can't use wine. Well, if we got to use the dang cup, which is what Jesus did, shouldn't we use dang wine? You see the problem with all this? Yeah, we don't have traditions. We're not like that. Please spare me. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. So our observation, what Jesus did that night, was to show the relationship, the fact that he does desire mercy. The extension of that mercy is inviting those people sitting with him and us as we remember that moment to invite us into this intimate relationship with him. That's what the communion service is about. It's not religious. It never has been. It never will be. It's relationship. That's the whole point. And we know what he does. So what we need to do is to prepare ourselves to partake of this, just what Paul tells us to do, because we want to come into that intimacy with him without baggage, without carrying anything to that encounter. So let's take a few moments for each of us. You go before the Lord on your own and get rid of the bags. Remember, what does God desire? Mercy. So no matter what you're bringing let go. There's mercy for it. Well, you don't know what I did. doesn't matter what you did. I may not, but he does. So let's go before the Lord, each of us, and rely upon that mercy that God has promised to extend to us because we want to know about him, right? So let's go as individuals before the Lord.